All right, so welcome to 404, everyone. I hope you're all having a good morning. I hope you're all having a good week. Um, so just a couple of kind of reminders and updates and things that are upcoming. Uh, next week is May, which is really crazy. Uh, so that also means we only have a couple of weeks left in the semester. So I know that everything is coming up really quickly and that you not only have final assignments and things for this class, but that you also likely have lots of other things in your other classes as well. And on top of that, I know you will have a lot of work and other obligations that you're dealing with too. So my best recommendation is to try to stay on top of everything as best as you can. Um, if you're falling behind on homework assignments, on projects, on studying for exams or whatever it might be, make sure you're reaching out to your professors, keeping them updated. And if there's anything that I can do to help you, especially for this class, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you're working on the homework and it seems like it's taking you a long time or you're not sure what to do, don't just sit there and struggle. Send me an email, schedule a time to chat in office hours, send me a text message, whatever it is, so that you can get the help. The, the homeworks are a little bit more challenging, right? They're, they're, there's calculations involved. They're on these newer concepts that we're talking about. And there is... Um, some challenging content in there. So I don't want you all to kind of sit there and struggle and, and wonder what you're supposed to do. So definitely make sure you're reaching out. I have noticed that only around 12 students have submitted homework number four that had a goal due date of two Sundays ago. As you all know, you can submit that with no penalty up until the midterm, not the midterm, we're well beyond that now, up until the day that your final accumulating project is due, which is on May 15th. So that's only, what, like 18 days away. So you can submit homework four up until then, you can submit homework five up until then. But what I want you to do your best to avoid is having to complete homework number four, having to complete homework number five, and work on your final accumulating project at the exact same time, because that will be a lot in a short period of time while you're also dealing with finals and projects and homework assignments for the rest of your classes and preparing um, for the end of the semester. So please reach out if you need help with anything so that we can make sure that you get everything done on time and that you're able to do well. Um, so that's one thing, make sure you're scheduling your last student hour, your office hour with me. I've met with many of you already. I have lots of meetings today and tomorrow with many of you. Um, as always, it's just a time to kind of check in, answer any questions you have, chat about how things are going, whatever it is. It can be five minutes long. It can be 20 minutes long. It's really kind of up to how the conversation goes and that doesn't necessarily have to be about the class. Um, just a quick check-in for everyone. Um, and then, yeah, just work on your final project slowly over this next few weeks, because it, that, as I said, the end of the semester is creeping up really quickly. And I don't want you to be stuck with trying to create those recordings and those information sheets that day before it's all due. Um, and as I said, if you want me to give you any feedback on anything that you're working on, I'm happy to, so long as you send it to me about a week and a half or so before the actual project is due, even if it's just a rough outline or a, this is what I'm thinking of doing, these are some ideas I have, I'm happy to either send you some feedback via email or chat on Zoom or on the phone or whatever it is that can help you make sure that you're going in the right direction so that you can all do well to finish out this semester in this class. Um, and then I think I mentioned this before, I know from talking to a lot of you in the first office hour that many of you are graduating. We're fortunate that we are gonna be able to have an in-person graduation ceremony this year, uh, which is really great. So hopefully many of you are going to be attending the graduation ceremony. I know it's a bummer that you can only have two people there with you because that doesn't allow you to have you know, the big family celebration and support and cheering that we would normally have at graduation that makes it so exciting. Um, but it still is an amazing achievement for all of you to be finishing up your degrees. For those of you who are, I will be there. Um, I'll be a, they call us faculty marshals, I guess. So I'll kind of lead in a faculty pro processional and then I'll, I'll kind of be there to help direct students of where to go. And probably, unfortunately, we'll have to deal with like making sure people are keeping on their masks and distancing and whatever the other regulations we're gonna have are. Um, but hopefully I'll see many of you there. You, you, it's hard to get, it's gonna be hard for anyone to recognize uh, each other. Cause like, I know I'll be wearing my, 
cap and gown from my PhD institution, which, you know, big robe, then we have to wear masks as well. And then, you know, we have those lovely hats that we have to wear as well. So pretty much like every part of uh, us will be covered except for our eyes. So if you can recognize my eyes or, or, or whatever, come up and say hi, I would love to meet some of you all in person at that graduation ceremony. And we'll kind of talk about that as we get closer. So um, any questions about any other requirements, anything that's upcoming in the semester or whatever it might be before we jump into this week's uh, new content. All right, so I'm gonna attempt to today share from my iPad um, and go through the PowerPoint presentation on my iPad, hopefully that remain stable because in the past it was giving me issues. Um, and today we're gonna talk about screening. So screening is an important part of uh, disease detection and for developing mitigation and prevention strategies to prevent the spread of disease in the population. And at the same time to also ensure that disease is being detected early enough so that people can get the appropriate treatment that they need to prevent adverse outcomes from that disease if it weren't caught early enough. So what we're going to do today is talk about the principles of screening and we're also going to talk about really um, get into what do we, how do we measure how good a screening test is at detecting disease in the population. And we'll talk a little bit about the screening test that we use for COVID-19 that many of you have probably had to take where, you know, they do the nasal swab um, to uh, then go and test to see whether or not you potentially are infected with COVID-19. So we'll talk a little bit about those as well to talk about how good those are and then also to talk about how you how we evaluate the effectiveness of a screening program overall and when we decide to use a screening program to detect disease in the population. But before we go into that, I did want to uh, mention, especially because a lot of this is related to some of the things that we've talked about throughout this course, especially related to study design and how we interpret and evaluate the quality of research that's being conducted and how we use findings from a singular research study or if, even from a group of research studies to make recommendations for either disease treatment, disease prevention, or about factors that are causally related to uh, disease outcomes. So many of you may have seen that recently, um, the media had picked up a uh, research study that was conducted by a team of researchers at MIT. And the, what I would hear is I just kind of did a screenshot, I Googled like MIT um, COVID social distancing research study and looked at the news section on um, Google. And these are some of the headlines that came up that talked about that particular research study. And so what's this say? Um, you know, some of the headlines are better than others, but some of them are extremely misleading and can be very alarmist at the same time, right? So MIT COVID study shows indoors, masks may be more important than social distancing. A new MIT study cast doubt on the so-called six feet rule. Will you still keep your distance? I cut this one on accident. It says MIT researchers say time spent indoors increases risk of COVID at six feet or 60 feet. Um, there's this one from Twitter, MIT researchers say, risk of contracting COVID-19 indoors, the same at six feet and 60 feet. And there's a lot of other headlines on Twitter on uh, when you Google, and I've seen a lot of things pop up on Facebook that have basically said, new MIT study shows that masks don't work. Why do we still have mask uh, regulations? Why are we still social distancing? We just need to open everything back up. This study shows that everything that we've done has been for no reason because it's not gonna prevent the spread of COVID-19. So what's the problem with all of these headlines and what's the problem with the way that they're being used? So there's, um, and this is one of the things that I want you you all to, to do when you see headlines like this about our health. 
um, and, and think about what, how were these studies actually conducted? What do these findings actually mean? And so what I did as well was I pulled up, this is an excerpt from the study that is the actual studies recommendations based on their findings. But before we even talk about these recommendations, what I wanna mention was that this was actually a simulation study that the researchers did. They didn't actually do research in indoor settings to measure the amount of uh, viral particles in the air. They didn't actually have any humans or anyone involved. It was actually just them using data to simulate and say, if this is how infectious COVID-19 is, is if this is how it's transfer transmitted in aerosols in the air when people breathe or sing or exercise, if the air has this amount of ventilation, this is what we would expect to see in terms of risk of transmission of COVID-19 in indoor versus outdoor settings. And based on that simulation study, they came up with the recommendations that say to minimize the risk of infection, one should avoid spending extended periods of time in highly populated areas. One is safer in rooms with large volume and high ventilation rates. One is at greater risk in rooms where people are exerting themselves in such a way as to increase their respiration rate and pathogen output, for example, by exercising, singing, or shouting. Since the rate of inhalation of contagion depends on the volume flux of both exhalation of the uh, infected individual and inhalation of the susceptible person, the risk of infection increases as, and this is one of their quotients in the model, and basically that is as there's more um, aerosols in the air. Likewise, masks worn by both infected and susceptible persons will reduce the risk of transmission by a certain factor in, in and this changes based on the quality of the mask as well. So basically, their recommendations that they made overall from the study actually don't have to do with the social distancing and how far apart our people are. What they do say is that when you're in an enclosed indoor space without good ventilation, that there is, because COVID-19 can transmit via aerosols, meaning that as we breathe, it gets, uh, if, if a person is infected with COVID-19, it can get suspended in the air from particles that, uh, in our breath, and that those aerosols can mix throughout the room that you're in. So in a smaller room, if a person's infected and they're breathing, then those aerosols will mix throughout that room more quickly. And so if there's other people in that room, then they can breathe in those particles and potentially get infected, regardless of how far those people are away. And this is actually something that in the last four to six months has been part of the recommendations and what um, the strategies that we've put into place to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 are responding to, where we don't want people eating indoors at restaurants and limiting capacity indoors, especially if there's not good ventilation because of that mixing of air. And if someone's infected, then everyone else could potentially breathe in that air and become infected as well, regardless of how far apart they are. But that risk of infection also changes by the amount of time that a person spends in that indoor space. If you go into an indoor space and you're there for a minute or two, that's much different than you go into an indoor space and you're there for two hours and there's a person breathing and they're infected and those aerosols are becoming suspended and you're, you're more likely to come in contact with them. They also say that wearing masks is probably a more important measure for prevention of COVID-19 for um, indoor spaces that aren't well ventilated because it will at least reduce the amount of that suspended air that people are going to be breathing in, but it doesn't eliminate it, right? Because our masks aren't perfect, especially if we're not wearing N95 masks where there's holes, right? So there's always gonna be potential for that air to get through and us to breathe it in. So the problem with a lot of the headlines and why I wanted to mention this is that they were very sensationalized and they took one piece of the article that said that these six feet social distancing rules aren't actually enough 
to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in indoor spaces that are not well ventilated. And if you remember back from earlier on in the semester when we talked about infectious diseases and what our mitigation strategies should be, we talked about the fact that we can't just rely on individual strategies such as masking and social distancing, that in order to truly prevent the spread of COVID-19, that we also had to modify our indoor spaces to have good ventilation, good HVAC systems where they're actually circulating out the air and cleaning the air so that there's not those suspended aerosols in the air that could lead to transmission regardless of that distance. There's also a lot of assumptions that the model makes in terms of how quickly those aerosols can spread throughout a room. Um, and, and that typically, if, say if I go into an Albertsons and I'm infected, then if I'm breathing that area that's surrounding me directly, people are gonna be more at risk in that area that's surrounding me. And then as I spend more time in that store, then obviously those particles are gonna become aerosolized and they're gonna spread throughout the store depending on the level of ventilation and air movement. But that doesn't mean that if I'm on one side of the store that a person that's on that same side of the store as me has the same risk of infection as a person who is 60 feet away on the other side of the store. Because even if that air that I'm breathing becomes suspended and moves over to the other side of the store, the concentration of the amount of virus and particles that are still in that air is gonna be greatly reduced, reducing that person's chance of infection, especially if they're only in that space for a limited amount of time. So in actuality, a lot of what this paper found supports a lot of the uh, strategies that have been put into place to minimize the amount of gathering indoors and in large group settings, to wear masks when you're in areas where ventilation isn't good, and so on. But a lot of it has actually been used as putting up some of these sensationalized headlines that say basically our strategies don't work, that we um, can't, you know, that we just need to open everything back up fully to um, get back on with life. So again, this is where taking one study, taking research findings from one area can be very misleading and can be used in the wrong way if the journalists or uh, don't understand the actual implications or what the study did, or if the lay public, people who aren't um, educated in how the science works and what they were actually doing, how that has implications for what this actually means. And to kind of top it all off, as I mentioned, this is still a simulation study. And while simulation studies can be really good at helping us understand transmission, unless we actually did true studies where we looked at these different spaces, that's really will only translate in some way over to what that looks like in a real life setting. And there are many variables that cannot be taken into account accurately in simulation studies because they're having to estimate what things might look like versus what they are actually like. So I just wanted to mention this because it's been making its rounds on social media, especially on Twitter recently, and it's been making its rounds on Facebook and, and other things um, as a way to kind of have you all think about how have some of the things that we learned about in the class, how can they help you evaluate and read through studies like this? Um, and really kind of think if, if you have a family member that's that's sees something on Facebook and it's like, oh, they there's this this headline that I saw that says masks don't work. So why are we doing this? Then hopefully you can go and look at the paper and say, all right, what is this paper actually saying? What can I pull out of it? How did they do the study? What does this actually mean? So that you can provide that um, more context about what these findings actually mean. Any questions? Any comments or anything? All right. So I'm just gonna do a quick, quick review of last week. Um, so last week, and this is just to kind of reintroduce these concepts again to keep them fresh in your mind. Last week, we talked about bias and confounding with bias being systematic error in the design, conduct, or analysis of a study that results in mistaken estimates of an exposure's effect or risk of disease. And we talked about uh, two separate types of bias. We talked about information bias, and we talked about selection bias, with information bias being bias in the way that we uh, collect data um, in that study that can lead to that data being incorrect in some way. 
And we went through a couple of examples of things like re uh, recall bias, reporting bias, surveillance bias, and so on, that can lead to um, us not getting an accurate picture of what's actually going on. The other thing that we talked about was confounding, which is actually a type of bias that's a feature of the data that's driven by the way that people respond and, and differences in uh, exposure status by disease status, essentially. And it's what we call this third variable problem. So if you remember, <coughs> a confounder is a third variable that's associated with the exposure of interest. It's associated with the disease outcome of interest, but it's not in the causal pathway. And it's generally the factor or the determinant that's actually leading to that disease outcome that we're interested in. So if we look at that example of coffee drinking and lung cancer, and there have been studies that have shown that coffee drinkers are more likely to develop lung cancer, what they found was that that relationship was actually confounded by smoking and that coffee drinkers are more likely to smoke and that smoking is associated with lung cancer. So there's actually no relationship between coffee drinking and lung cancer, but rather that relationship existed because there's that higher prevalence of smoking among coffee drinkers, which made it look like there was potentially an association between coffee drinking and lung cancer. So when you're evaluating research studies um, and looking at things that are published in the media, what I want you to think about is what else could be going on. And I, was, I just uh, thought about a, another example that I had recently seen that I think was on CNN or another news article where it said the headline of the article was people who I think it was, and I'll, I'll pull it up at the end of class. I believe it was people who eat French fries three times per week are more likely to die of a heart attack or to die early. I forget exactly what it was, but I'll pull it up. So what I want you to think about when you hear a headline like that, people who eat French fries three times per week are more likely to have X health outcome. What else, when you think about people who are eating French fries three times per week, might also be going on that could also be leading to them to have that disease or that health outcome that's being talked about in that research study. There's, and, and this is what we talk about with confounding is that people who engage in one potentially problematic health behavior are also more likely to engage in other such behaviors. So what other foods are people who are eating French fries three times per week eating at that same time? Are they also eating a hamburger every time they eat French fries or a hot dog or pizza? Or are they eating other potentially unhealthy foods that could also be leading to those health outcomes? What do their exercise behaviors look like? Are they being physically active and meeting the CDC recommendations for physical activity? What are all of these other risk factors that they potentially have that could also be leading to those particular health outcomes? So when we think about it, is it the fact that they're eating French fries three times per week, or is it this culmination of factors that could be potentially leading to the development of that disease? And so what becomes problematic about those headlines and about those studies that are trying to pinpoint that one particular factor that might be associated with some health outcome is that those are often behaviors that are done in combination with many other behaviors that can also potentially affect our health in the long run as well. And if we're not taking into account those other behaviors, it's impossible to tease out what might be going on. When we think about this from a disease causality standpoint as well, we think about back to when we talked about chronic diseases in uh, causal inference, we know that for most chronic diseases, it's not just one thing like eating French fries per week that's going to lead to the development of diabetes or heart disease or cancer. It's a combination of that sufficient component cause model where there might be different components of every single person's disease and that combination of those component, components taken together in that particular time and space are what together combine to lead to those potential health outcomes for that individual. So we need to be careful about how we're re making recommendations about how we have headlines about how things affect our health because that 
sensational, sensationalization of those research findings can lead to mistrust in the public in terms of how we talk about our health and what's good and what's bad for our health. And I always say, right, like we don't want to eat French fries five times per week. That's probably not going to be great for you. But that doesn't mean don't eat French fries at all. And typically the public health messaging that we have is everything in moderation, right? It's okay to eat ice cream. It's okay to eat cake and French fries and do all of those things. So long as that is not every single meal, every single day of your life. And so what we want to do is allow people to engage in these behaviors, but in a manner that they're also engaging in healthy behaviors and minimizing that potential risk that can hopefully minimize their, um, their adverse health outcomes in the future. And the moment that we try to say, you have to eat only healthy food, eliminate all things like French fries and all of this stuff, then that's where we're going to lose people, right? We already know that most research, that most programs to, and all of you are in kinesiology, and I know many of you are personal trainers, your health coaches, you work with clients. It's really difficult to get people to change their behaviors, right? It's sometimes almost impossible to tell people who are already not being physically active and who are, have a diet that is consisting of largely foods that we don't consider to be healthier foods that it's really hard to get people to, in the long term, change those behaviors consistently to exercise regularly and eat healthy. And what we do know is that typically elimination strategies and telling people you can't eat all of these things, that you have to follow these strict regimens, that while they might be effective in a very short amount of time, that in the long run, those strategies are not effective at actually improving people's health and that sometimes they actually backfire and that people will engage in those healthy behaviors for a short period of time. And then once they're no longer being closely monitored, they're actually behaviors when they go back, they're eating less healthy, they're exercising even less and they either you know, go back and gain all that weight or they develop all those adverse health outcomes again. And so we have to be mindful about how we think about how do we get people to engage in healthy behaviors. So, and we'll talk more about that a little bit next week, because next week we're going to talk about physical activity epidemiology, a little bit about nutritional epidemiology and chronic disease epidemiology as kind of just uh, here's some of the trends and things that we're seeing in research and what's going on um, in the United States and globally right now and what we need to do to move forward to improve the health of the population as a whole. So for today, we're gonna to focus on screening. Um, and screening, as I mentioned, uh, we're gonna talk about what it is, when it's appropriate, what the characteristics of a, a good screening test are, and then bias that can affect screening tests. So what is screening? So screening is what we call the presumptive identification of unrecognized disease or defect by conducting some test or examination that can be applied rapidly. So screening tests have a couple of different characteristics. One important characteristic of a screening test is that they can be done quickly, meaning that you don't have to do some highly invasive or potentially um, um, problematic uh, procedure to be able to potentially identify disease or defect in a person. Um, the goal of screening is to detect disease before we would have if we didn't screen. And ideally what that goal for screening is, is to actually detect disease before symptoms occur. So if we think about, and I'll give you some uh, examples of screening tests, but for example, for um, high blood pressure, we can do screening for high blood pressure um, by just doing you know, blood pressure measurements. And those are done all the time at health fairs, at doctor's office, when you go to a doctor's visit, typically you have your blood pressure taken as one of the first things that's done. That's a screening test to monitor blood pressure and to detect potential high blood pressure. So that if a person does have high blood pressure, that they can either be put on medication or be given you know, specific physical activity and diet recommendations to reduce their blood pressure, 
before that leads to other adverse health outcomes like heart disease or like um, stroke or other things that could result uh, from having high blood pressure. So the goal of screening is to detect disease early before symptoms occur so that we can treat it earlier to improve survival and adverse health outcomes. When we think about screening, and if you go all the way back to week number one, and we gave that definition of epidemiology, part of that definition was that we do research for the prevention of disease. And if you remember back to week one, I know that was probably felt like decades ago at this point, uh, we talked about three different levels of prevention. There is um, first level of prevention, which is to prevent disease before it happens in the first place. So that would be ensuring people are physically active, doing things like socially distancing and wearing masks so that you're not exposed to COVID-19 and get infected. Um, so that would be all the things that we can engage in to prevent development of disease in the first place. Then there is second level of prevention and that is what screening is. And that second level of prevention is Let's detect disease early so that we can put into place strategies to treat it early so that a person's prognosis for that disease is better and so that it prevents any potential other adverse outcomes in the future. So for example, if we're able to detect a cancer through a screening test when it's stage one cancer, that person's long-term prognosis and their chances of going into remission are much better then if we wait until that person starts to develop symptoms and then that cancer is recognized at stage three or stage four, where now that treatment has to be more aggressive, their outcomes are a little bit poorer and so on. And then the third level of prevention is tertiary prevention. And that is somebody has the disease and that we want to now minimize the burden of that disease. So tertiary prevention, <coughs> excuse me, would be something like a person has type two diabetes They've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Now we want to ensure that they're taking their medication properly, they're checking their blood glucose regularly, and that they're getting regular medical care so that they can prevent things like diabetic ketoacidosis, diabetic retinopathy, where people can go blind as a result of uncontrolled diabetes, diabetic neuropathy, where people will lose their feelings um, in their nerve endings, and so you lose feelings in your hands and legs, and then that can also lead to a long-term outcome of potential amputations uh, in people who have really uncontrolled severe diabetes um, that, that can become so severe that they'll have to have their, um, so say for example, commonly people with severe diabetes that's uncontrolled for a long time often have to have things like leg amputations because those nerve endings are dying. And that becomes now dangerous because it can, uh, the body can no longer regulate it. And there's a lot of potential health outcomes as a result of that. So that tertiary prevention is let's prevent all of those adverse things that can happen as a result of um, a person having an uncontrolled uh, disease that they're not getting proper treatment for. So examples of screening tests, I already mentioned blood pressure, other ones that you all may have had or that you know family members that have had, uh, cholesterol testing when you go to the doctor, uh, tuberculosis testing. So I believe all students, or if you work in a healthcare setting, you're required to do get a TB test every so often. Um, you have to get a TB test before you start working in any kind of clinical setting. And then every couple of years after you work in a clinical setting, and that screening test is typically what we call a PPD test. So that's the little where they stick the amount of fluid underneath your skin. And then the whole idea of that is it's seeing if that um, fluid that they stick under your skin, it has a little bit of the um, bacterial agent in it. And it's seeing if your, your body responds to it with the antibodies and produces a little bit of bump. And basically that bump indicates that you have antibodies already in your body and that you are potentially infected with tuberculosis, but you're not always. There are times where that uh, PPD, that tuberculosis skin test, can produce what we call a false negative result. If you've ever gotten the um, BCG vaccination, so the tuberculosis vaccination, it's not, it wasn't commonly given in the United States, but anyone who has family members who, who grew up in the Philippines or in a, another Southeast Asian country or Asian country, uh, they were fairly commonly given um, 
um, the BCG vaccination. And you might have recognized like a family member has a scar on their arm because the vaccination commonly caused a, a fairly large scar on the arm. Um, that, that if a person has been vaccinated for tuberculosis, that that will actually cause what we call a false positive result on tuberculosis skin. So essentially that, that screening test will be reactive, but it doesn't mean that there's no tuberculosis. So instead, well, if somebody has a positive uh, tuberculosis skin test, they're not told you're positive, we need to give you treat for tuberculosis. Instead, we'll follow up diagnostic test, which is really a chest action. Um, chest x-ray is done to actually look at signs of bacterial action in the lungs. Um, and they're looking for, um, oh, lagging a lot, you said. Hmm. Is that happening to everyone? Yeah. Okay, we'll pause really. Let me see what's going on. Apologies Thank you for letting me know, Stasia. First, yeah. Um, maybe if I take off my iPad, maybe that's the cause. Let me share my screen, my computer, and see if that helps. Is it still lagging talking just now? Uh, you're fine on my end. Let's see what I'll do to, I'll stop my video. Ideal, I know, but stop my video because I'm kind of not having, so can help um, if there's any of lagging. Uh, does that seem okay? Um, and let me share my screen on my computer. All right, how's it sounding for me now? It's still a little bit laggy. Yeah, uh, when you talk, Professor, like your voice is kind of choppy. Interesting. Um, let me. Give me a second. I'm going to see if I do anything for my internet. I can like understand you. It's more like if you're like kind of echoing or like if you're like sick type of voice. Oh, weird. <laughs> uh, okay. Let, well, let's just kind of get through a little bit. I only have about maybe 15 more minutes, 10, 15 more minutes. And I'll kind of, what I'll do is I'll have some sample problems at the end that we would, we're going to go through. But I'm kind of just go through a little bit quicker and then I can post some additional video that um, will helpful that hopefully will be easier to understand and I'll try to also talk slow maybe that'll help hopefully hopefully that doesn't work worse so definitely chat in if there's any is and you all can't understand um, anything that I'm saying or if it gets worse or better or anything so Okay, so talking about different screening tests, we've talked about tuberculosis, uh, and then there's depression tests. Well, uh, where for depression, basically what, what usually happens for a different screening test, it'll fill out a question where we ask different questions about symptoms that they'd be experiencing, and that's meant to detect probable depression or sin. It's not meant to substitute for potential of a clinical diagnosis where you actually do a clinical interview with a psychologist or psychiatrist to have a diagnosis of depression. In a perfect world, seen test would identify every single person who is and only people who are sick. And if the credit identify everyone who is not and only those who are not sick so that we truly know who has the disease that we're interested in and who doesn't have the disease that we're interested in. And also in a perfect world, the test will consistently produce the exact same results every single time that it's conducted. So for example, 
if you do a COVID-19 test and you do two tests back to back and that first test comes back positive in a perfect world, that second test would also come back positive for COVID-19 as well, so that you're getting reliable, consistent results every time that test is done. But we don't live in a perfect world. Screening tests are perfect, and we'll talk about how and why they're not perfect. But one of the reasons why they're not perfect is that screening tests are not meant to be diagnostic. And there's a difference between a screening test and a diagnostic test. So screening tests are used, as I said, for identifying early signs of disease in people who typically have no signs or symptoms of the disease, but might have risk factors for disease. So say you had a potential exposure to somebody who has COVID-19, then you would go and get a screening test even before you develop symptoms to see, or if you never develop symptoms, because so many people are asymptomatic, to see whether or not you were actually infected with COVID-19, because that tells you whether or not you can spread it to other people if you were infected. With things like COVID-19 or flu, typically speaking, if a person already has symptoms, and this is especially true for the flu, they actually don't recommend that you go and get tested to see if it's the flu because that going and getting tested increases the number of people that you come into contact with that you could potentially spread that disease to. And if you already have symptoms, what they typically do is they call it influenza-like illness or ILI. And that indicates that that person may have the flu, but they haven't done a test to determine whether or not it is the flu. For COVID-19, the recommendations have still been that people go and get tested, even if they have symptoms most, in most areas, because we want to know the prevalence of COVID-19. We also want to know whether or not it's truly COVID-19 or some other infectious disease agent that's leading to those symptoms because COVID-19, people develop the same symptoms as they do for the common cold or the flu. So we, we have to be able to distinguish between those things and where we are now. A diagnostic test, on the other hand, in relation to a screening test, is used among people who are suspected to have disease, either due to symptoms, due to a positive screening test, due to laboratory findings, due to physical findings. So for example, we have many screening tests for things for different cancers. So uh, e examples are things like uh, women getting mammograms at certain ages or going and getting um, pap smears or men getting um, prostate exams um, at a certain age to check for prostate cancer and so on. And so those, if somebody is, um, gets, if a woman gets a mammogram, for example, and they find a lump or they find something that they might suspect could be cancer, that is just a screening test to then go and do further diagnostic testing to determine whether or not that is cancer. And what that further diagnostic testing is, is a biopsy. And so as you can imagine, that biopsy is more invasive, has more risks involved, is more painful, and so on. And so we don't want to jump to just doing biopsies for everyone to detect the presence of uh, cancer or any other disease. We want to first have a good or suspect that something could be going on and want to confirm that. Same thing is true for things like HIV testing, where if you've ever been tested for HIV, they do the rapid test, you get your results in about 15 minutes. Those tests are really great. But if someone gets a positive test, that's still considered a preliminary positive test. And they have to do further diagnostic testing where they draw blood and they do different laboratory tests to detect the presence of the actual virus in that person's blood. So screening tests are that typical preliminary test that's done to identify early signs of disease and get people in for further diagnostic testing and treatment. There's the two concepts I talked about, and those are reliability and validity or accuracy. 
Reliability of a test is its ability to consistently yield the same results over time and with different observers. That's what I was mentioning earlier is that in a perfect world, it's gonna give you the same result every single time. Our world's not perfect. And one thing that can greatly affect the results of a screening test is who administers it and how well that person is trained. So if you think about for COVID-19 testing, many of the early tests, and we have some better tests now, but the test for COVID-19, if you've ever been tested, they had to go all the way up to basically like the top of your nose on the inside of your nose. And if you've ever been tested, it, I know for me, I visited twice, it was very uncomfortable. It caused me to immediately tear up um, and, and just feel like I had to sneeze. But if the person who's doing the test doesn't get up deep enough and swab in the right way, then that could lead to an incorrect or unreliable result, not because you don't have COVID or you do have COVID, but because the test wasn't administered properly. So for all screening tests, having people trained properly is an important part of improving reliability of those tests. And then the other principles of screening tests are validity or accurate, accuracy. And that is the ability of the test to actually correctly identify people who do or do not have disease. And there are multiple ways that we establish validity for screening tests. The most important thing to establish validity is that we have to have some gold standard against which a test can be evaluated. So what that means is if we're testing for COVID-19, that we first have to actually to evaluate the validity of the screening test that we're using where they do the nasal swabs or they have screening tests now where you can, um, they can do cheek swabs or you can spit into a little vial and they can test your saliva. Um, in order to test how good those screening tests are at detecting SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 infection, they have to first establish a group of people who have been infected with the virus. So you start out with people who already have COVID-19. They've done that with diagnostic testing. They've done a blood draw. They've been able to find the virus in their blood. And then they administer that screening test and say, all right, we know this person has COVID-19. They compare them to a group of people who don't have COVID-19. And then they administer them all the tests and say, all right, among those who have COVID-19, did that test say they have it? Among those who don't have COVID-19, did that test say they don't have it? And based on those responses, we're able to establish the test validity. And there are four different things that can happen as a result of a screening test. I'm gonna start my video back to see if maybe it still starts to, um, if it still is okay while I'm talking, if it messes anything up, let me know. So when we're establishing the validity of a screening test, there are four different outcomes of a screening test. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, one second. Um, there are, so four different outcomes of a screening test. So as I mentioned, and we're gonna use two by two tables again, I told you that we use two by two tables a lot in epidemiology. The two by two table is set up in a very similar way that we've set up all of our other two by two tables where we have disease positive on the top, disease neg on the right hand side, uh, positive on the left hand side. And that's the truth. That is these people have undergone diagnostic testing and we know that a certain group of people have the disease and we know that a certain people, group of people do not have the disease. And then all of those people are administered a screening test and that goes on the rows. And there's two potential outcomes from a screening test. A person can either test positive or screen positive, or a person can test negative or screen negative. And then when we look at the cells within our two by two table, that A, B, C, and D, the same as we did before, we can label each of those cells based on the truth and the results from the screening test. And there's four potential outcomes. The first outcome is cell A, and that is our true positives. A true positive means that a person has the disease and that when they take that screening test, they test positive. So that means that that test correctly identified a person who is sick. There's false positives, which is cell B, 
And a false positive means that a person does not have the disease. We've already confirmed that, but they test positive on the screening test. So that means that that person is going to get an incorrect false positive test result, even though they do not have the disease. The third outcome could be what we call a false negative. That's cell C. A false negative means that the person has the disease, but screen negative. So now that test has incorrectly set, told somebody you don't have the disease when they actually do. And so this is also an outcome that we don't want to happen, but happens depending on how good the test is. And the last outcome of a screening test is true negative. And that true negative is a person screen, uh, does not have the disease and they screen negative. So that means that that test was correct. They were correctly identified as not having the disease by the screening test when they don't have the disease. So those can all be summed into um, when we look at our true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative, we have four different measures that we use to evaluate the validity of a screening test. Those are sensitivity, specificity, and predictive value positive and predictive value negative. First thing I'm gonna tell you about these four different measures, the wording is very confusing and people commonly mistake sensitivity, specificity for each other and predictive value positive, predictive value negative for each other. So make sure when you're doing the homework and you're looking through these things that you kind of have up these definitions and what you're looking for. The sensitivity of a screening test is how likely the test is to detect the presence of disease in someone who has it. So essentially sensitivity is the true positives. Specificity of the disease is how likely the disease, the test is to detect the absence of disease in someone who doesn't have it. So that is your true negatives. And then our predictive value positive and predictive value negative are uh, values that we look at these a different way and say, if someone tests positive, what's the likelihood they actually have the disease? If someone tests negative, what's the likelihood they actually have the disease? So that predictive value top positive is if someone tests positive, what's the likelihood they actually have the disease? The predictive value negative is if someone tests negative, what's the likelihood they actually have the disease? And we can look at that in our two by two table for doing these calculations where our sensitivity, very similar to how we do other calculations for two by two tables, sensitivity is our A over A plus C or true positives over true positives plus false negatives. So sensitivity is everyone who tests positive out of everyone who has the disease. So if we have a sensitivity of 96%, for example, that means that 96% of the people who have the disease will be correctly identified by this test. Specificity is D over B plus D or true negatives over true negatives plus false positives. So that means among those who test negative, how many don't actually have the disease essentially. So if we have a specificity of 97%, that means that 97% of those who don't have the disease will be correctly identified by the test. Our pr predictive positive is A over A plus B or true positives or true positives plus false positives. Our predictive value nib is our true negative or D over C plus D or true negative plus false negative. So again, you have all of these formulas, so don't stop memorizing them or anything. And then what I wanna do quick is just go through an example before we end. And this is gonna, so is my sound okay? Is everything fine now? Should I go through example or should I just do something separately if it's not okay? Oops. Uh, it's fine. It was just a bit choppy in the last slide. Okay. So it's kind of coming yeah. in a little bit. Yeah. All right. I'll attempt to go through it. And if uh, hopefully it remains kind of stable. And then what I'll do is I'll also, there's already some videos on how to calculate sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value on Cougar courses. Um, and then I can post some extra things after this where I,
just kind of record beyond the slide alone uh, separately to you all. So as I mentioned, the deal world, all screenings would be 100% sensitive and 100% specific, where it have no false positives and no false negatives. But in practice, they're actually inversely really, where as our sensitivity goes up, our specificity actually goes down. So as we get better at detecting the true positives, our ability to detect the negatives goes down as first set. As we're better at detecting the negatives, our ability to detect the positives goes down. And there's a whole science behind why that is. We're not going to really go with that in this class because it can get fairly complicated. Um, but just know in general that sensitivity and specificity are typically inversely related to each other. So let's go through a quick example. Say a scientist develops a new test to diagnose diabetes. He tries it in an endocrinology clinic, which sees patients who have diabetes and some other endocrine problems like thyroid disease. And he gets the following results. He had 306 people with this new screening test. And he has knows that he has 225 patients who have diabetes. And then he has 135 of those patients who do not have diabetes that they're being seen for some other kind of problem in his clinic. And so he tests all 306 people with this new screen test. Among the people that he tests, 231 positive, 129 test negative. And that's broken down by the positives false positives, true negatives, false negatives are in um, this two by two tape where of those 225 people have diabetes, 250 test positive. Of the 135 people don't have diabetes, 109 people test negative. So that means that we have 16 people who are falsely told that they have diabetes from the screening test, even though they don't. We have in people who screen negative and would be told they don't have diabetes on the new test, even though they do. So the calculus sensitivity, we just do 250 over 225, gives us 96%. So that tells me that 96% people with diabetes test positive diabetes. Testing the specificity would be uh, 119 or 135. And that tells me that 8% of the out diabetes are correctly identified as not having diabetes by screening tests. So it's pretty good, right? Most people who have diabetes are detected. Most people don't have diabetes, correctly told they don't. But there are still people who aren't correctly, incorrectly told they do or don't have diabetes. And say, the price of the in clinic, the prevalent diabetes is C2%. So now, based on the prevalence of diabetes being 62%, and then by two table, we can calculate our positive and negative predictive value. So our positive predictive value is 215 over 231, or A plus B, and that gives us 83.1%. So that, what that tells me is among those who test positive, so this top row, 93.1% actually have diabetes. The predictive value negative is D or D plus C, and that's 119 over 129, or 92.9%. And what that tells me is that among those who have negative, 92.2% actually do not have diabetes. So this kind of gives us that what's actually going on, how many people positive, don't actually have it, how many people test negative, actually have it, and so on. So now let's apply this screening test to a family medicine department to kind of understand how these things can change. So this, how good a screening test can actually depend on the prevalence of the disease in the population. So let's say we use that exact same screening test that we talked about in that endocrine department, with a sensitivity and specificity of 96% and 88%. So we want to test 1,000 people in this family medicine department, and the prevalence of diabetes is 5%. So the first thing I need to do is fill in my two-by-two two table 
based on that prevalence of 5% and those thousand people. So I bought them right hand side, just like we did all of our other two by two tables. I put a thousand, it's how many people I'm testing. Now I need to figure out how people have diabetes of those thousand. Well, the prevalence of diabetes is 5%. So in order to get a number of people with diabetes, I multiply that 5% by 1,000 and I get 50. That 50 goes at the bottom of my first column because that's the total of people that would have diabetes in the medicine department. So that means 950 people without diabetes. So before I move on, does everybody see where I got that 50 from? How I multiplied 5% by one thing and gives me the total number of people with disease. Yes. Does that make sense? Good, cool. So then I need to fill in my cells, my true positive, false positive, false negative, true negative. So in order to fill in my cells, and I wish that I kept my iPad up, but I don't want to since I'm already having uh, audio issues to prevent any other additional lag. In order to fill in my true positives, I wanna look at my sensitivity of my tests. So remember, sensitivity is how good the test is at detecting people who actually have the disease. So what that tells me, my sensitivity being 96% is of these 50 people with the disease, 96% will be a true positive. So in order to get my true positives, I multiply 0.96 or 96% by 50. And that's gonna give me 48. So that tells me that 48 of the 50 people with diabetes will be correctly identified by the test as having diabetes. And then that means that two people will be have a false negative result. My specificity of my test is my true negatives. So what that tells me is of all those 950 without diabetes, how many are gonna be correctly identified as a true negative? So in order to get my true negative, I multiply 0.88 or 88% by 950. And that gives me 836. The most common mistake that I see on homework assignments for these two by two tables for screening is that students will multiply the specificity by the total number of people without disease and put that in cell B. That is common because thinking about the normal two by two, two setup that we're doing for like case control studies or cross-sectional studies and so on. But just remember that that specificity is true negatives, not false positives. So when you multiply that percent for your specificity by your total number of people without disease, that goes in cell B. And then that means that my cell B is 114 or everyone else. So then based on filling in this test, I can complete my two by two table totals and I can calculate my positive predictive value, which is gonna be my true positives over true positives plus false positives or 48 over 162, and that's 28%. I can calculate my negative predictive value which is gonna be true negatives over true negatives plus false negatives. And that is 836 over 838 or 99.7%. So let's compare that screening test in an endocrine clinic to a family medicine clinic. In the endocrine clinic, the positive predictive value was 93%. So that means 93% of the people who tested positive have diabetes. The positive, the uh, negative predictive value was 88%. 88% of people without diabetes were correctly identified as true negatives. But in the family medicine clinic, only 28% of people who tested positive actually had diabetes, while 99.7% of the people who tested negative actually did not have diabetes. So what changed here? Why? is our positive predictive value, especially so drastically different in these two clinics? And the answer is right here on the slide. Anyone wanna take a stab at it? What's different about the two clinics? <laughs> 
uh, one's for family practice and another one's like uh, specifically for endo the endocrine clinic. So what's different about those two clinics in terms of the prevalence of diabetes? Uh, one's higher than the other. <laughs> yeah, so the prevalence of diabetes, as we mentioned, and that endocrine clinic is 62%. So that means a large number of the patients there have diabetes because that's why they're going to that clinic. Whereas, sorry, in that family medicine practice, it's only 5%. And that's gonna be more similar to what the prevalence of diabetes is in the general population. So one principle of screening tests is that when the prevalence of disease is low, our screening tests actually don't do as good at actually testing people uh, at, at giving um, good sense or positive and negative predictive value. And the positive predictive value especially is affected by the prevalence of disease, where in many cases, when you have a low prevalence of disease in the population, there are unfortunately a larger number of false positives than we would typically want to see. And that's what we see in this family medicine practice. And even though that sensitivity of that test is 96%, so you would expect that's really high, right? Among those with the disease, 96% are detected. But that high sensitivity comes at the risk of us also testing people positive who don't have the disease. So that means that we're gonna also test a lot of people positive who don't actually have it and our positive predictive value is low. What I'm not really gonna talk about too much today, but there's a little bit in the recorded lecture online is that not only does this, is this affected by the prevalence, but sometimes we'll change the sensitivity and specificity of the test depending on the disease that it is that we're interested in. So there are times when we are okay with people getting a false positive screening test. So for example, if someone has a false positive SARS-CoV-2 test, the risk of that false positive test is not extremely high. The main risk is they're gonna to be told to quarantine and to limit their exposure to other people so they don't spread the disease on the other people. But if someone gets a false positive, say they get a false positive um, cancer screening, then that's gonna to lead to a follow-up biopsy that has inherent risks for infection, for other adverse health outcomes, and so on. So now we're potentially having a higher burden because of that false positive. So a lot of things go into us determining how we want to actually use these tests and what they mean for follow-up when we're looking at, especially what's the prevalence of the disease in the population? What are the implications of a positive? What are the implications of a false negative? So for example, uh, for things like HIV, for an HIV test, the test usually we want to have a preference for um, having a high sensitivity for HIV tests because we don't want people to get a false negative test result. Uh, because what a false negative test result would mean is that they um, are told you don't have HIV, they're not gonna be put into treatment, they're not gonna be able to receive the medication in a timely manner that they can to um, remove, reduce their viral load to undetectable so they can't spread it. And it might have implications for them potentially spreading it to other people because they've been tested, they were told they don't have HIV, and now they go and have, um, say, uh, sex without a condom, and they could potentially spread that to another person if there's not other prevention measures put into place in that particular uh, sexual encounter. So that false negative test result has implications for the potential spread of disease. False positive though for HIV tests, we wanna minimize as well, where a false positive test, and this is the same for many diseases, can also have a lot of uh, mental anguish and burden where there's, because there's still a lot of stigma surrounding the positive for HIV, that people who, are, who test positive HIV because of stigma and that it's talked about society, 
that often people into a very anxious state become depressed. Some people actually become in the past, and this is less common now because of all the support that's provided by the medical system, but people have become suicidal as a result of an HIV positive test. Um, and, and so that false positive test isn't without its potential occasions as well. Um, so that we need to ensure that you know people know that those false po that those positives that that doesn't you know in a screening test there needs to be that diagnostic testing as well, especially because the prevalence of HIV in our population is very low. In the general population, prevalence of HIV is less than 0.4 percent in the United States, but there are certain groups where the prevalence is higher, where there might be different recommendations for testing. So there's a lot of different discussion, conversation, let's get through these examples now, that went to a, when we're thinking about what are the principles of a good screening test? How do we use screening to detect disease, to follow up with diagnosis, to make recommendations and so on? Um, but some of the things that we think about we're using screening is one, that the screening test, the condition we're screening for should be an important problem like COVID-19, like HIV, like cancer. We want to make sure that we're putting into place the right programs. There should be a suitable test or examination that can be used to that's acceptable in the population, that's low risk, that has good follow-up, that there should be accepted treatment available. So we don't want to screen people and they're not just um, potential follow-up or accept treatment for example, mitigation strategies and so on. And it should also be an agreed upon policy on whom to treat as patients and who receives treatment. And, and that should be everyone, right? So everyone, if somebody HIV positive test results, everyone should have access to the medication that they need to um, treat HIV and make it go into being undetectable in their body. But the unfortunate reality is, is that for many of our treatments, many of the mess system uh, access that we have, it's inequitable, right? So some of test positive for HIV, medication on a monthly basis can cost thousands of dollars. And that means if someone does have good health and that can cover the cost, they may not be able to afford that medication to be able to treat that disease. Or for many cancers, for many other diseases, the treatment that people need to prevent them from getting worse or to cure them or whatever it is, is oftentimes exorbitantly expensive. So for example, if a person has, is test positive for hepatitis C, uh, treatment, then we have hepatitis C treatment used to be very lengthy and actually some painful. Um, and, and so the, Treatment for hepatitis C used to take many, many months and would, you know, cut a lot of money. We have newer treatments now that will just take almost for about a month or sometimes shorter, but the course of treatment treat hepatitis C on average cost about $90,000. So that means that only people who have real insurance who are willing to pay for that hepatitis C treatment are able to get it. Or there's the treatments uh, for many other conditions that can cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars so that if someone screens positive and then they get a diagnostic follow-up test and they're positive, we have highly inequitable access to many of those treatments. So for example, I have a, um, a family member who has a thyroid eye condition and they have um, a rare, you know, it causes swelling of the eye, it's painful, it can cause vision problems. Um, and the medication, there's a new uh, pill that can be taken for it. And that medication costs $110,000 and their insurance doesn't cover it. So that becomes problematic in terms of access to who can have treatment, how they can have treatment to treat those uh, medical conditions that they face. And so these are all things that we need to think about and that we need to make more equitable across our system, not just when we're developing, designing, um, screening programs, but also diagnostic and treatment programs as well. For things like COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, thankfully for everyone, um, the vaccination, it's free, right? So this is a rare case where, you know, you don't have to have insurance, you don't have to have any kind of uh, access to medical systems on a regular basis. Anyone can go to one of the vaccination sites 
and get a, a SARS-CoV-2 vaccination for free. And that was is an important policy strategy to ensure that we can control COVID-19 in our population, because if it costs, we would have even more inequitable access to the vaccine than we already have, because it would marginalize the groups of the population that don't have health insurance and or that don't have regular access to a medical system where they can get the vaccination. So we have to think through all these things when we're thinking about how do we protect the health of the population and roll out these different strategies. So I did have some examples, but because we're running a little long and my volume is being a little bit weird, we can go through these maybe at the beginning of next week too. I wanted to actually have you go through a couple of examples of, of what our screening for our COVID-19 looks like. And there's multiple different types of screening tests. There's an antigen test and there's a rapid, well not rapid, rapid screening test um, that's used that have different sensitivity and specificity. And so thinking through like, when should those be used? What do the test results mean? And so on. So any questions for today? And Edith, I would say warble is a word. That's something I would say if somebody was sounding kind of a little bit all uh, distorted, I guess. <laughs> All right, well, if I'm not hearing any questions, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes if anybody needs anything. Um, but let me know if you have any questions about any of the requirements for the class, about screening, about bias, about confounding, about study design, about whatever it is that you are interested in. I'll show you that example that I was talking about with French fries next week at the beginning of class as well. But otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and rest of your week. Um, we're coming up on the end of the semester, so hang in there. The end is in sight. Hopefully, you're able to relax over the summer a little bit um, and, and kind of uh, take some time off if you're able. But otherwise, let me know if you need anything. Don't hesitate to reach out anytime, and I will see you all next week. Thank you.